Bueno, buenos días. Good morning. Let us start with our second uh, session. I think that yesterday we all had a wonderful session, very fruitful one. And let us start this panel devoted to the protection and access to the UCH threats and challenges. And the approach to this panel is the following. We will work from the basis of licit and illicit access to UCH, meaning that UCH can be accessed in an illicit manner. And for that, we will be listening to exceptional experts. And then we will see how uh, initiatives uh, centered around museums and new technologies are being applied. All these tools allow us to have access to UCH in an easier manner. Since we have a lot of speakers uh, this morning at this panel, let us start without further ado. Let me start by introducing you to Juanjo Aguila. He is a representative of uh, Guardia Civil. First of all, first, I would like to thank the Ministry, the Ministry of Culture for his invitation to take part in this panel. I work at the Operational Central Unit of the Civil Guard. It is a judicial police unit and it is a unit uh, whose work is devoted to fighting different types of uh, threats, among them those affecting UCH. Yesterday it was a pleasure for me meeting up uh, with uh, lots of people that I already knew in the sense that I've been uh, working in this field for uh, eight years. I met Barbara Davide, who I have met uh, eight years ago in Kazakhstan, uh, also other colleagues. And also I met uh, Cameron, uh, with whom I work in previous missions. I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt in calling ourselves a small family. As I was saying, Guardia Civil has got as one of the main missions uh, to protect uh, civil society, to provide safety and security to Spanish citizens. And the competencies that have been entrusted onto us has allowed us to protect both citizens and UCH. We are privileged, uh, so to speak, because we, thanks to our competencies and powers, we can work uh, with uh, other groups uh, for devoted to subaquatic or uh, underwater activities and judicial units. Therefore, all together, all these units uh, perform their work in an, in an efficient manner allowing for the fulfillment of our mission. We also work with divers, with specialized uh, um, civil guard officers, specialized in underwater operations. They work in, um, in seas and uh, water areas. We work in close uh, relationship with the Ministry of Culture. Uh with the Ministry of Culture, and we also work with other Directorate Generals because we deal not only with UCH, we also deal with uh, paintings, with the sculpture, etc. But in this specific area, there is a collaboration partnership with both the Ministry of the Interior and the Ministry of Culture. And one of our main characteristics is that we are a military body. Therefore, we are officers, we are uh, military, 
And so that gives us a lot of flexibility, allowing us to work in different scenarios by means of patrolling operations in many uh, African countries. For example, we also work at uh, ministries of foreign affairs throughout the world, etc. This close collaboration of ours with the Ministry of Culture allows us also to have access to information that has been previously gathered via the consultation of state registries. It also allows us to be warned about people who are requesting sensitive information and so that makes us uh, create an uh, alarm or an alert state. We also work with ARQUA, and we have here the representative of uh, ARQUA. We work in collaboration with the National Police Guard Forces. And in those meetings and gatherings, you have the chance of working with uh, subaquatic or underwater uh, special operation forces together with the uh, National Police uh, Force and uh, therefore obtaining very fruitful results. Lately, we've been developing training activities with, uh, in collaboration with the Ministry, whereby we train our divers. And uh, it is uh, also essential for uh, capacity building we also work in collaboration with the underwater unit, specialized unit in uh, Andalusia. I work very closely with its representative, with uh, Dolores. We also work uh, in collaboration with Valencia and with uh, Catalonia. Oh, I didn't know she was here present in the, in the audience. So this is our modus operandi, by collaborating with other units, by exchanging information. We also work with the Army, with the Navy. And here we have two representatives of the navies, and they provide us with the um, best uh, possible capacities underwater and sea capacities. It allows us to conduct our protection operations and our prevention operations. We work in collaboration with the unit for um, operational um, actions and activities. We also work in collaboration with um, a center which is located in the province of Madrid. It is a surveillance center And if we have any suspicions uh, or suspect that uh, any ship is uh, dangerous, we work in collaborations with them. We locate the ship. And then we also use cameras and sensors and very sophisticated networks for surveillance and patrolling operations within coastal areas. We work, uh, therefore, with Frontex which is the security specialized uh, agency, uh, which uh, has been entrusted with the task of surveilling the area of the strait, of the Strait of Gibraltar. They set up uh, electronic devices for localizing the ships. And uh, this is uh, what we use in our terminology. We, we call them rubbers. And so that allows us to track, to track the route of these illicit boats carrying drugs. And so this device, this operational device, uh, is uh, deployed throughout the coast of the Gibraltar area. We have also been implementing the coordinates of the RECs. The idea being 
implementing this system um, on our side so that we can have a more rapid uh, reaction towards any danger or threat to underwater um, heritage. If we receive a warning from the ministry or from the Navy, or if we read about any piece of news, we can set up a prevention um, disposal operation. Here on the screen, you've got the number of units working throughout our, uh, coast, our coasts, the uh, service maritime surveillance service was first started some decades ago so as to uh, comply with the basic law for law enforcement uh, being one of our competencies the surveillance of the seas and territorial seas since we have been improving in our operations and in our level of information, we are privileged in the sense that all countries do have their own ships, but within our special uh, unit, we are lucky to have our own divers, our own specialized team devoted to the protection of nature. And so that has allowed us to specialize in different areas so as to all together combat these illicit operations. The special subaquatic unit is um, trained uh, by, by us and they help us in, uh, in the localization of some sites. We also work in collaboration with uh, diving centers and we always work on the basis of trust and confidence. Here on the screen, you've got an iconic uh, image of the Odyssey case, which took place in the south of Spain. And there was an order, judicial order, um, requiring this uh, ship a Odyssey ship to come back to port and already 10 over 10 tons had already been identified detected and they had used some um, devices and an, um, and an air plan so as to deceive us and um, also we conducted an operation in relation to this in Tampa, Florida. This op our operations allow us to know the names of the crews, uh, allow us uh, to, uh, to know how to intervene, how to detect the rock. We operated and we seized the cargo of the vessel, of this Odyssey vessel, and we put a label, we put just a label saying civil guard uh, operation because we were quite angry at them, at their way of acting. And so we'll say, okay, let us mark you so that everybody, everybody knows that we have conducted an operation on you. And uh, so we wanted to convey that message so that we could, that could be seen what we were doing. And we sometimes make some sort of criticism and we see that sometimes we do not show efficiently enough what we are doing in terms of our operations. That's why we decided to carry out that action. And sometimes we conduct operations that allow us for the restitution of UCH. This is a wonderful uh, image. And uh, for us, it is wonderful. But then when we take these objects to the museums, it is not that wonderful in the sense that uh, museum experts do have to conduct their experts' uh, analysis on the objects uh, 
recovered. And sometimes the result is that these objects are not authentic. And uh, I'd r I would rather uh, recover just one single piece which is original rather than 3,000 which at the end of the day are not originals. We do have uh, capacities and we have links uh, with other police forces, uh, units and bodies. We work in collaboration with Europol and throughout the years we've been building on relationships with other countries that uh, afterwards allows us to establish first contacts and if necessary, we can go and formalize those contacts and links via the use of the already established channels, communication channels, or collaborations with the Ministry of Culture, with the Navy, so different actors working on the same scenario and with the same objective. And sometimes when we have in front of us a problem which is very complex, we require the help and the collaboration of other units or, for instance, of uh, diplomacy if it's necessary in case uh, there are state interests involved. Maybe we, as uh, police forces, we want to go onto the battle directly, but then uh, diplomacy um, advises us to take a different approach or at least to use different uh, times. So we always work in the basis of collaboration among the uh, stakeholders, all the stakeholders, and obviously, providing us with great amounts of support. We also collaborate with academia because uh, from academia we obtain a lot of uh, um, important and relevant data, for instance, regarding art pieces which are already being traded in the market. And sometimes that is the starting point of our investigation. We have to consider that the art market is a legal market. However, we sometimes identify um, illicit uh, trafficking there. However, uh, for instance, uh, combating illicit traffic of drugs is easier than illicit traffic of art. And also we have to consider that these days uh, some of these pieces are traded uh, on the internet and this uh, sometimes poses a complication uh, to our investigation. So again, let me conclude my presentation by thanking again the Ministry of Culture for their invitation. I am at your disposal for anything you might need. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Juanjo. It is always a pleasure listening to you, and we we all like to to be civil guards. I think uh, Juanjo has provided us with the right information as to how to avoid any illicit uh, traffic. Uh, uh, operations or activities against UCH and all the different actors must be involved so as to deal uh, or fight against illicit trafficking of UCH. This is the way ahead for success. Let us now listen to uh, Cameron who will uh, tell us how, we, how they work from OSTE and the work they perform at Customs. Thank you again to the uh, uh, organizers for this event and for inviting the OSCE. 
Uh, just as a, a starting point, how many of you know what the OSCE is? Can you put up your hands? Let's see, one, two, three, maybe four, okay. Long story short, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe is the world's largest regional security organization under Chapter 6 of the UN Charter. What does that mean? That means we have 57 participating states from North America, all of Europe, the former Yugoslavia, Turkey, former Soviet Union, and Mongolia uh, as representatives and participants in the platform. Uh, it can make it quite difficult, but within that, uh, we do everything uh, under the sun that relates to human security political, military, security, uh, and environmental and economic. What does that mean for me? Uh, what does it mean for me and why I'm here? Uh, I am the head of the Heritage Crime Task Force and the Program to Combat Trafficking of Cultural Property at the OSCE, and we'd take a look at uh, that area of crime, the cross-border linkages, and the ties to organized crime, terrorism, financing, money laundering, and corruption networks. Bit of a mouthful, but uh, that is kind of what we do in a nutshell, and that'll sort of set the context for, for what we do. Um, what I want to talk to you a bit about today is how you can use my team and come to us uh, as a means to actually enhance the work in combating trafficking and protecting underwater cultural heritage as well as terrestrial heritage uh, and find a way to make law enforcement work with academia, with the experts, and find a way to disrupt these networks and stop these pieces from moving in the first place. If we dial it back to 2017 when I first met Captain Aguila, uh, what this project started out was as an idea. The idea and understanding, of course, was that border guards, customs agencies, police, uh, museums were not talking to each other or even paying attention to this area of crime, for the most part, except in, in silos. I mean, museums were, but uh, the police and customs were not. Uh, at that point, you know, it, it, it's easy to look at a, a customs officer and say, well, why don't you look at this? But a customs officer cannot be expected to be an art expert, an archaeologist, to have an understanding of what they should be looking at. And to them, it's not obvious that what they might be looking at crossing the border is a crime uh, or potentially funding crimes. It's easier to stop a gun, to stop drugs. Uh, these things are obvious threats, whereas an amphora coming across the border or coming into port is not necessarily. So our job is to make those customs officers and those border management officers care, to make them actually do something, to understand how to do it, to use their networks, and actually understand how to handle these objects carefully, build intelligence networks, and do something that leads to a successful prosecution and hopefully a repatriation. So in 2017, as a pilot project, uh, the idea was to just bring people together, awareness raising. We would, did regional meetings in places like Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Cyprus, Montenegro, Mongolia, Italy. And you know, we started to build some traction. We started to get an understanding of who this network was. We started to build an expert roster. And we started to get an idea of where the trafficking networks were operating and the sorts of things that they were doing uh, in order to try to evade police. Fast forward to 2021, uh, I came over to the organization and we decided we needed to do something better. We were getting tired of uh, just going to talk shops, just sitting in classrooms and not actually doing something about it. Uh, I'm sure you've heard, maybe not, uh, but the OSCE has had a reputation in the past uh, and the acronym has often sometimes stood for uh, Organization for Seminars and Conferences in Europe, <laughs> uh, Old and Seriously Confused Europeans, or the Organization for Sowing Chaos Everywhere. So, we decided we didn't want to do that anymore. Uh, we wanted to do something real, something tangible, something operational where we could actually start to make a difference. So with that, uh, we put in place a brand new program to combat trafficking of cultural property and turned our expert roster at the time of about 10 experts uh, and turned it into the Heritage Crime Task Force, which today, after two and a half years, is now 61 officers and exports, experts from 34 different countries and international organizations. That includes border guards, police, financial investigators, forensic investigators, cyber investigators, military, uh, museums, and ministries of culture, as well as state prosecutors. What we do as this team and what this team does for uh, the participating states is that uh, we offer capacity building for frontline officers, help them to understand what they should be looking for, how to handle objects, how to actually do an investigation on site at a museum, at an archeological site, how to conduct dark net investigations, uh, and financial investigations that are underpinning the, the financing networks, uh, as well as how to present these cases to a state prosecutor so that it actually makes a difference and that it can actually be something that's taken up in court and can find success either nationally or internationally. Within that, um, we do several different things. As I said, we do capacity building training. This involves simulation scenario-based training with the task force. We bring experts into a sub-region. Uh, we put participants into a mixed group to understand how they need to work across borders, knowing that you know, when we went to places like Lithuania or to Turkey, 
in country, uh, you know, there's ministries that were talking, or rather working on the same case, working literally 50 feet across the street from each other. They could wave out their windows and see each other, but they weren't talking to each other. And it's the same crime group they're investigating, the same pieces that had gone missing. This doesn't make sense. And we knew if it wasn't happening at a national level, then it certainly wasn't happening at an international level. So we started bringing the mixed groups. We bring in different countries and we say, okay, Finnish police, you're gonna work with Norwegian Customs and Latvian financial investigators. And over the course of the week, you are now going to be put through a series of fictitious crimes. You're gonna get on the ground, collect the evidence at a fake museum, uh, crime scene, uh, an archeological site that's perhaps been fictitiously uh, you know, hit by mortars uh, and understand how to collect that evidence, preserve that evidence, and then present that case to a state prosecutor. We also do active investigations. If a participating state comes to me and says, we had a museum robbery, we had a looting event, uh, there was an underwater uh, looting event, we need assistance, can you bring the experts? I can send my team within 48 to 72 hours to help do that. We've done this uh, you know, dozens of times already. We currently have 26 active investigations. Uh, and I'm happy to say that there are people in this room who are part of that task force that helped with this, including Captain Aguila, Professor Timmy Gambin, Carlos Andres from the Ministry of Culture, all part of this task force that we've curated over the last two, three years to be those experts that we can call upon. Quickly as well, we also do uh, analysis of the trafficking networks and network disruption, and we help those uh, learners to understand how they're now part of a regional intelligence network that can be used and accessed in real time. And what we wanna do is empower those officers to use the full extent of their powers <clears throat> as a customs officer, perhaps, if you have 72 hours to seize an item, use the full 72 hours. Use that 72 hours to verify space in that cargo container, to defeat the paperwork, to make a phone call across the border to that guy, perhaps you met at a workshop, a workshop like this that knows the answer that can say, yo, I have these amphora. I think there's worms and, crust and you know, uh, crustaceans on them. Could you help me identify it? I would then call up somebody like Timmy or somebody else in this room that could then help to identify and build that case to make it stronger without having to wait weeks and weeks and weeks because at that point, an item is gone. How does this relate to underwater cultural heritage? Um, we are now having done seven of these conferences and workshops, as well as national workshops, 27 active investigations. I'm now proud to say, working with Malta, uh, we are now moving into the realm of underwater cultural heritage training. Uh, and this October, we will be doing uh, a workshop bringing divers from across Europe and North America to Malta, where we're gonna be doing underwater crime scenes uh, and use of technology underwater for the investigation of underwater uh, cultural heritage. Uh, this will involve underwater photogrammetry, uh, hopefully setting up some underwater crime scenes, uh, and working with Malta and using their expertise to understand, help the learners understand what they can do in the underwater environment to preserve evidence, preserve the scene, and uh, you know, continue with the case. We're gonna follow this up in the new year uh, with an event in Portugal, working with our colleagues there uh, to take a look at how this can also be done in riverbeds and estuaries, understanding the technology that Portugal already has in place uh, to map the riverbeds, to find the sites, share that information uh, when it's uh, normal time or peacetime and you're not looking at an investigation, so that law enforcement can understand where these sites are, so should an emergency ever happen, they know how to respond quickly and they know who the points of contact are. And conversely, should something ever happen, those ministries, museums, uh, museums uh, and other experts know who the law enforcement uh, officers or customs officers or investigators are in country in order to you know, facilitate an investigation more quickly. Um, I think I'll keep it there because we're gonna be short on time, but should you have any questions, do come and talk to me. Uh, we're open, we're expanding our team all the time. Uh, and like I said, we've got 61 experts and officers at the moment across Europe and North America constantly working on this on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, we are active, we're out there, we're doing something, we're making something happen in real time and not just, um, well, spreading chaos everywhere. <coughs> as, uh, the OWL acronym used to say. So, back over to you, Paloma. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Carmelo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carmelo. I am really impressed at the way they work at OSDE, the simulation workshops where they show not only how the different units work, but how we should all work all together so as to prevent uh, the crimes and, and to act uh, rapidly as soon as the crimes uh, uh, have uh, been committed. So that's a wonderful initiative, so congratulations. Let us now 
talk about the main topic and main topic which is the case of treasure hunters and I would like now to give the floor to Luis Montero who comes from the University of Lisbon and he will tell us how private companies uh, work in this regard so as to avoid the illicit trading of uh, UCH. Well, thank you very much for your invitation. I will switch uh, on to English and uh, I'll start now. The hunters unwillingly because in 1993, treasure hunters bribed some members of the Portuguese government and they passed a law that basically opened the Portuguese waters to treasure hunting. I was based in the Azores at the moment. The Azores had several shipwrecks containing treasure inside. We didn't know where or what ships were actually sunk there. And suddenly we had a swarm of treasure hunting companies coming from Florida, from Belgium, everyone wanting to dive in the Azores and looking for these treasures. So I spent all of these years researching treasure hunting, their networks, and their models operandi. And this is basically to deal with, um, treasure hunting deals with a very, very narrow slice of history, which is between 1500 and 1850, and it's mainly directed against Iberian shipwrecks, so Spanish and Portuguese ships, because these were the ones carrying readily sellable goods. So we are talking about silver coins, gold coins, and Chinese pottery. And this has to do with the movement of the age of the discoveries when the Portuguese and the Spanish expanded the maritime borders of Europe into the world. And this was done using ships. These ships were carrying, for instance, artillery. And what people do with our Iberian heritage is now up to them. For instance, in Thailand, this fisherman found a Portuguese bronze cannon from King Manuel I of Portugal, and what they did with it was they cut it to pieces to make a statue of Buddha. In Mozambique, when you see the balcony of the Ankara Cafe, you will notice that it's all composed of shreds of Ming pottery because there are dozens of Portuguese shipwrecks around the Mozambican island and people dive to get the shreds, look at the Spanish silver coins that were sunk with those Portuguese ships in the 17th century. They melt the coins and they produce these kinds of jewelry that they sell to the tourists for four to five euros. So this is basically people salvaging ships and taking profit of heritage to make a living. But then there are corporations that look for gold. They look for silver and they then sell gold and silver in international auctions. Portugal had its first go at treasure hunting in 1974. We had the Carnation Revolution in April, so the fascist government was thrown out, the people were shouting in the streets, and the Belgian diver Robert Stenwy, one month later, taking profit of all of this commotion, went into Porto Santo Island in Madeira and found this wreck of the Dutch ship Slot der Hoek, which immediately went into auction. This is Robert Marx. He is now fortunately dead. <laughs> <laughs> but in 1993, he was the guy that bribed Rui Gomes de Silva, which was a member of the Chamber of Deputies in Portugal, and who was in family with the Secretary of Culture, Pedro Santana Lopes. And they made this law, as I said, that basically opened the Portuguese waters to treasure hunting companies. And so Robert Marx was one of the players, as was this German count, Nikolaus von Zusandizel, 
who created the company, made basically part with German monies and Portuguese monies, and which had on its meeting board, on the boarding, had this guy, which was a, an admiral in the Portuguese Navy, who basically said that we are mainly interested in looking for jewelry and stuff that is basically um, valuable when we are not really interested in looking for archaeology of the ships. The majority of these people, they, as you can see from the, the, the secret convenience of this company, was to obtain a significant return on invested capitals from auctioning precious remains. And this is also the very, very secret um, meeting list of the people that were shareholders. And these were very important people, not only in Portugal, so the main private banking family, which is Ricardo Salgado, and the Spirit Santo were the main uh, founders of this company. But we had a lot of people like, for instance, the pretenders heir to the Portuguese throne, Don Duarte de Bragança, a guy that was a Navy commander, was put in prison for corruption for seven years, and is now dealing in arms with the Portuguese government. And a lot of people from the high society in Lisbon. They tried to go to the Azores. We fought against them on, as a citizens. And when the government was overthrown, so Antonio Guterres, which is now chairman of the United Nations, was invested as a prime minister, one of the main actions that it took was to repel this law. So Archeonautas, the name of this company, they had everything set, so they moved to Cape Verde. And they did in Cape Verde what every company does everywhere in the world. They go there and they say, you have a lot of shipwrecks. A lot of these shipwrecks have treasures inside. You don't know where the treasures are. You don't know where the shipwrecks are. We have the expertise, we have the divers, we have the archivists. We know their locations. We will take the risk of going into the water, finding these sites, excavating them for you. We'll split the merchandise in half. You'll keep the best pieces, and everyone is happy because you will have your museums filled with really good-looking stuff, and we will make a profit of the repetitive coins and whatever. This is how they sell this everywhere. So they sold this to mainly the Minister of Defense, Napoleon Ulpio Fernandes. So basically they bribed him. They went to Cape Verde. And then they produced again another very um, secretive report, which was the estimated value of shipwrecks in Cape Verde. So what they were really looking at was how much money can we make out of the cargo of these shipwrecks. So. I suspect, I cannot confirm it, that this guy, which is, was one of the richest persons in, Lisbon, in Portugal, was laundering money via his branch of the Cape Verde Insular Bank using this treasure hunting company. Anyhow, he was the main shareholder. And once you start diving, you start looking and finding stuff. This is from the Guadalupe a Spanish ship sunk in Brava Island in Cape Verde, and they took a lot of jewelry and coinage. And this is another example of how things can go really, really wrong with treasure hunting companies. They found what we suppose to be a Portuguese-built uh, astrolabe, silver plated, unique in the world, and when the Cape Cape Verdean government said, we want this astrolabe because it's unique. The company said, well, listen, we have spent 2 million euros already in operational costs. Can you pay them back to us? And Cape Verde said, oh, we don't have that kind of money. So we will have to export this and auction it. And they sold it to the Marinese Museum, which is a maritime museum that follows the Chrome, uh, Code of Ethics but they still managed to buy this astrolabe. And why? Because this is not technically a treasure hunting venture. It's an 
archaeology company with a legal binding contract with a government. So they could actually export it and sell it to a maritime museum. They had people on board pretending to be archaeologists. They never set foot in Cape Verde. One of them was Manson Bound. You might remember that he famously discovered the shipwreck of Ernest Shackleton in Antarctica a few uh, a year ago. Another one was Margaret Rule, the famous archaeologist from the Mary Rose, which was also paid by this treasure hunting company. There were secret operations that took treasures from Boa Vista Island in Cape Verde to, uh, to the, the, the Netherlands. And I was in Puerto Rico. And when I was in the Maritime uh, Museum of Puerto Rico, I found artifacts from Cape Verde that had been sold in auction by treasure hunting companies. So again, archaeonautas moved from Cape Verde after they had ransacked everything to Mozambique. How did they do it? They managed to, so on top you have Nikolaus Sandizel, the German count, owner of this treasure hunting company. And to your right you have Jacinto Veloso, a general in Frelimo, the former Mozambican Ministry of Defense, former head of the Mozambican Secret Service, and a facilitator that managed to get this treasure hunting company into Mozambique. They had a contract with the government, exactly saying the same things. And when uh, Mozambican journalist Carlos Cardoso exposed these um, dealings on these newspapers, he got suddenly killed by unknown people in Mozambique. So they start diving in Mozambique, finding it, Mozambique have never been dived by treasure hunters, so they were shipwrecks and bronze cannons and gold coins and silver coins everywhere. And they start selling all of this stuff in Christie's and in Sotheby's. Their modus operandi is basically not archaeology. They say they are doing archaeology, but they are using only treasure uh, metal detectors, excavating these with, um, with this kind of apparatus. And then, of course, only picking what is metallic and selling those in auctions. This is big business. There are no archaeologists on board, but they have a lot of lawyers. They have a lot of bankers, and they circulate the money around. Because, for instance, in England there was a loophole on the tax uh, code, which meant that if I owed the crown 20 million pounds in taxes, I could subscribe a treasure hunting venture by Robert Marine Fraser, I would get five million pounds deducted and everyone won except the crown. They used a lot of guns, of course, because you have treasure, you have to have guns. These are people from Archeonautas. And then, here you go, you have uh, one article exposing this loophole and how people were, rich people were actually investing in companies that were ransacking African and the water culture heritage. So this was basically another rush to Africa in order to steal their heritage, sell them in auctions to rich collectors in, in Europe. I'm almost done. Treasure hunting companies are now adapting to the convention of the UNESCO. This was done before the convention was applied. This is the General Abatucci, a treasure hunting venture done by David Mearns from Blue Water Recoveries, the guy that just found another shipwreck in Canada the week before. And they are now, for instance, transforming Archeonautas company into a non-private foundation. They are now based in the Netherlands, and they are, you know, saving the world's heritage by investing in Africa, and again doing the same thing as they have done before but not so brazenly open right now. They have put me into court. That's why I know so much about them. I was um, accused by them of defamation. So I lost a lot of money paying lawyers to defend myself. I was acquitted twice in Portuguese courtrooms. 
And then I took all the information I had and I sent it to the Mozambican government. And then they discovered that instead of really making money out of shipwrecks, they were actually putting their own money into the company. So the company was earning twice from auctioning Mozambican underwater cultural heritage and from getting money from the Mozambican government. Um, the people that accused me of being a very bad person and defaming this very nice archaeological company was a Portuguese Navy admiral, the Portuguese Minister of Culture, and the Tile National Museum director. So as you can see, they have connections everywhere. And this is because the Portuguese uh, Minister of Culture was a uh, mother-in-law of the guy that had really funded this company. Uh, another one was the Cape Verde's defense minister, and the expert that they had is a condemned forger and a coin thief from the National Mint. They got Kevin Costner to sell clothing branded Archeonautas for them, and you will see that Kevin Costner was so enthusiastic about treasure hunting that uh, he hired Alejandro Mirabal, which calls himself a nautical archaeologist, he is not, he's a marine biologist. He dove with Fidel Castro in the now defunct Carisub, which was a company that Fidel Castro made looking for Spanish galleons in Havana. And Alejandro Mirabal said that he's a nautical archaeologist. He is not, I wrote to Lenin's um, university in Havana. And they said, no, no, he has no degree in archaeology because we do not concedes degrees in archaeology, is only a marine biologist. And so Kevin Costner is now working together with Alejandro Mirabal. And they sent a party of people in 2023, something like that, to Cape Verde to again look for shipwrecks. And once I knew that they were going there, I phoned my colleague in the Cape Verdean Institute which I had helped train in, Mo in Mozambique. And I told him, listen, Kevin Costner and Alejandro Benebral are going again to Cape Verde, and this is not going to look good for your shipwrecks. So they sent the Cape Verde in Juicy Police, and they arrested the American divers that were together with Alejandro Mirabal. Last year, I was an expert for the South African government, because Alejandro Mirabal and Kevin Costner wanted to go look for a shipwreck in South Africa that had the remains of the Chinese summer pavilion. So, treasure hunting can be what some Spanish divers do on the weekend, and it could be a really, really big corporation with a lot of ties with money laundering, with tax evasion schemes, and basically looting some vulnerable countries on the water culture heritage in order to sell it to rich collectors in America and in the United States. So that's it. Thank you. Bravo. You have to I think it's uh, oh. Alexandre. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Well, we all know how the treasure hunter companies work, but we, we, we are always, we continue to be impressed when we hear that uh, again. So, the importance of the convention, the more countries ratify, the more protection we will have, or the, the more power we will have to uh, kick them off. And uh, now, let us move on to licit access of big visibility projects, and what we do in terms of sharing UCH. Well, we are a bit tight for time, especially if we want to leave some time for questions and answers. Please, I would like to ask the speakers to be a bit faster. Let us give the floor to Antonio Spinazza. He is the director of Villa Jose Museum and uh, owner of Bofere. It's one of the best practices by UNESCO since 2017. You have the floor, Antonio. Good morning, UNESCO and the Ministry, for having invited me to take part in this seminar. I would like to uh, congratulate you for your impeccable organization, Pablo Antonio Maria. You have carried out a wonderful uh, job. So, uh, the 
uh, shipwreck Bouferrer was discovered 25 years ago, and it has the name of the discoverers. It is the biggest uh, vessel of the High Roman Empire. They were uh, traveling in the 67 year after Christ. We, they were carrying a cargo of amphoras, and, uh, and they had the seal of Neon Emperor, who was the owner. And when it was on that route, it deviated from the course, probably due to a storm. And therefore, they set, sought uh, ports, which is the last port between Cadiz and Roma, and Rome, which is Villa Joyosa. We have signs that at the time there were no, uh, well, there were shipwrecks or ship builders. In Villa Joyosa, and probably other vessels from other Roman uh, crews or Roman vessels repair the vessels in Villa Joyosa, but this uh, vessel sank one kilometer away from the beach. It was awful for them, but for us it was a great luck. So there were like uh, Baitica vessels that were the biggest in the world. Wolferer is 25 meters below sea, and it is 300, uh, but there are the vessels that are 300 meters below sea, and that not easy to access, whereas Bofferer is easy to access. And we carried out several campaigns with the coordination of Jose Antonio Mayo from the University of Alicante and then preservation of the Villa Museo. We have excavated some 10% and the project is led by the regional ministry or government of Valencia with the participation of the Council of Villajoyosa and the Nautical Club. So there is several institutions, several entities, public and private, and this is a very good example of collaboration between different among different institutions i would like to highlight the great support that we had from the our regional government despite the different political colors different political parties and different uh, political parties in power the, what we see on the screen has been seen before we and the photographer or the camerographer is Juan Antonio Moya from the university. He has done videos, he did filming, photographs to create innovating forms of accessing UCH. We need those types of materials. Then we said, why not allowing sport divers to share their experience of excavation live? That was a challenge. It was pioneer, we organize visits with the authorization of the regional government. We set up like groups of five divers when the site was not being excavated, and it sounded a bit reckless. We had, well, they require great organization. Actually, we decided in a manner that it was mandatory to pay a visit to the museum before diving. So they, yes, then they also visit the labs for restoration of underwater um, uh, materials. They touch the amphoras at the museum or the lab so that they didn't uh, fall into the temptation of touching the amphoras when they found them. We told them the history about the shipwreck and we explained those sport divers the how, how, how we uh, do things uh, rather than what we do. Well, we cleared the doubts that they had. We also uh, told them about the expectations that we have for that unique uh, site and told them that it is the best uh, site for archaeologists. It is a time capsule. It is a perfect time capsule. So after visiting the museum, we briefed uh, uh, them at the port and the archaeologists that were accompanying them uh, told them how to move about, uh, how to dive. And then that was done with the, together with the local diving club. 
that will support in the project with the oxygen bottles, etc. We also carried out satisfaction surveys, and we could see that diving immersion had a high score, like 7.9, but the visit, the visit to the museum had two decimal points higher. And I said, well, how can it be that you are visiting or going to one of the most spectacular standing sites in the world, but what you like the visit to the museum even more? Well, they say that they get a high understanding, a deep understanding. They understand that that they are going to see, it's also, uh, it belongs to everyone. And after that understanding, they are really, really satisfied. In my um, classroom, uh, my lessons, I always say that there are two main objectives. That is to say, creating accomplices and creating uh, amateurs. So we have created uh, accomplices for years now, and that's the reason why we were acknowledged as the best practice by UNESCO. Very many divers have participated in our projects, and they have done follow-up on the advances of our researchers, etc. Villa Museo is a reference, international reference museum, and we also applied that to images. This is Elena Pros on the photograph. She is a blogger. She is tetraplegic, and she is uh, diving, as well as other people with disabilities. This is the briefing that we do at the nautical club before the diving, and this is the visit to the uh, storage of the amphora, and they they are being told that in 2021 it was this museum was uh, recognized as a reference museum of Iber America. For us, that was a huge responsibility. We tell them how to do sustainable science. Next to this warehouse, this is. Well, you see that these boxes have been done with recycled wood pallets. Next to that, we have the lab, and then we tell them how pieces are restored, etc. This is the photograph from Antonio Moya, and this is the side of a vessel. And this allowed us to build a model, a play model scale. And we use the same construction process that Romans used. We also print it out at the scale. And also, we did a virtual model, a virtual model of the <coughs> shipwreck, and then we took it sailing. And together with them, we won several international accessibility prizes, and it is one of the most important awards that we got, one of the most important in the world. We used to compete with football stadiums, with cars, with IT uh, software. And that project, our project focused on Bofferer. We refer to it as augmented accessibility. And it was about the whole process of selecting of pieces, uh, virtualization, 3D printing of uh, heritage pieces. And of course, bearing in mind all kinds of accessibility uh, needs. We set out 14 parameters, etc. In 2021, the regional government, and I'm finishing off, set up or installed a protection system at the site that was an innovative uh, system. Well, the system is already obsolete. 20 years have gone by. Now we have designed a new system in 2020. Well, COVID-19 came, so we took a stop or we stopped to redesign, to rethink this new protection system that will be soon applied. It is a non-gravity system, longer duration. It is um, has different modules have been designed by the University of Alicante together with the local company uh, for uh, IT company. So this is a photograph of Villa Joyosa with his South East in Alicante. Under the medieval or Middle Ages villa, we have the Roman remains. Um, Nowadays, it is well known for the colorful houses, and now it is uh, doing smart tourism. The model is based on five X's, accessibility, accessibility, governance, innovation, and technology. We are applying all that to both Ferrer. Right. Well, if you're interested, we could also discuss impact of the project, implication, non-engagement of civil society, volunteers, etc. Well, this is all from me. Thank you. Muchas gracias.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Antonio, for your outstanding presentation. It is so clear the importance of your project. We have all loved what you do first, that is to say, visiting the museum to uh, raise awareness about what they will find when they just uh, go underwater. So now we give the floor to Timmy Gavin, coming from Malta. He is the head of UCH at Malta. He will share with us the experience that they have had in Malta uh, regarding the use of new technologies for UCH. Uh, perfect. Okay, so in Malta there are three entities involved in the uh, protection, management, etc. of underwater cultural heritage. The superintendents of cultural heritage is the regulator. Heritage Malta is the operator, so the one that opens the sites to the public, um, organizes access. And then there's the university that carries out the bulk of the, uh, of the research. Three words that guide our work are explore, record, and share. And everything we do is encapsulated in these, uh, in these three words. So explore, why? Because to manage, you need to know. You can't manage what you don't know. That's a fundamental uh, of, of, of life. Whether you're a parent or a businessman, you need to know what you're, what you're managing. Uh, and therefore, we have a systematic uh, survey. The idea is to cover the uh, entire territorial waters of Malta, which are not as big as of Greece or of Spain. But uh, suffice it to say that we have 10 times more seabed than we have land. So, you know, that's a, a fair amount when you put it in, uh, <coughs> in context of the size of our island. Okay, so once we, uh, once we find something, we've got a whole classification system based on national importance. So how many of those sites are there locally? One to five, sorry, unique, two to five, six to 10, more than 10. Uh, then we apply internationally. So is, how many sites like this are there internationally? One two to five, etc., and depending on, on the numbers, we give a heritage score, and depending on the heritage score, then we decide where to put assets and, uh, and effort. So the recording that we, that we do, everybody knows what photogrammetry is, so we go from this, a sonar target, to that, okay? So now, uh, this gives us the basis of uh, many other studies that, uh, that we do. But, and I, it's a warning, if, if it looks like I'm obsessive about underwater cultural heritage and shipwrecks, I am. And so the level of detail of recording is, uh, goes beyond what uh, possibly a normal person would, would do. So we also look at the invisible impact of the shipwreck on, uh, on the environment. So the visible impact of the environment on, of the shipwreck or the shipwreck on the environment, which are the corals, etc., we'll see in a minute, that's obvious to see, much easier to study. But shipwrecks, especially metal ones, are also impacting the, uh, the sediments with heavy metals, lead. So uh, we've started a campaign last year where we sample around the wrecks, which we, we started in the immediate. From this year, we started radiating to calculate how far the wreck is impacting the, uh, the, the sediments. This is not something new, it's been done before. What we're doing is we're doing it in deeper waters. So the previous studies were done at 35, uh, 34 meters, the published studies, Ours are wrecks um, at 55 meters and, and beyond. This is not to show that we dive deeper. It's one, our shipwrecks happen to be in deeper water, but two, there is a difference between a shipwreck in 34 meters with regard to light, nutrients, etc., 
compared to a shipwreck at 100 meters, for example. Um, and talking about light, we deploy this instrument on our shipwrecks. We deploy, them, we deploy it for about uh, seven or eight days, and we measure light hour by hour. Uh, not only the quantity of light, but also the quality of light. Why? Because the environment we were uh, looking at okay, is impacted by light. Also, if, not if, when climate change takes hold and possibly changes the visibility or creates turbid layers, this is going to change the light, which will change the growth. And if we change the growth, it, it uh, may accelerate the degradation of metal, which will accelerate the release of oils, for example. But it will also accelerate the degradation of the heritage site. So this means that we may need to record it quicker than we thought. So what was low on our heritage score now can, can shoot up. So no more reactive uh, efforts. This is being proactive and being basically climate change ready. Um, and in order to know what we're protecting, we also have to record the marine life and the use of shipwrecks, you know, sorry, the use of marine life um, with, with in, tan, in, in tandem with shipwrecks, we discussed this yesterday, elevates the importance of shipwrecks. However, and we've just submitted a, um, an application for funding, the, 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 the term we're using, the, the, the term ecological hotspots is commonly used, but now we're calling them ecological islands. And to give you an example, on one historic shipwreck, there is more black coral, which is the white, actually, plant you see in the uh, top right-hand corner. There's more black coral on one World War I battleship than there is recorded in the rest in its natural habitat. So now, whereas 25 years ago, when this obsessive mad professor was knocking on the door of marine ecologists, they would tell me, isn't it obvious you have an artificial reef, you will have life. Today, they say, whoa, if something happens to the corals, to the protected corals in their natural habitat, where are they going to be replenished from? Our protected shipwrecks. Because we declare a, uh, an area of protection, sometimes up to 500 meters, okay? And uh, therefore, we are now looking at these as uh, ecological islands. They can also act as ecological islands in the negative. If the lionfish makes its way to Sicily, it's going to make its way to a shipwreck in international waters and eventually make its way to a shipwreck in Malta. So a part of the uh, funding we've asked for will go into studying how long these invasive species take to, uh, to travel. Again, to be invasive species uh, ready. And um, we, we're also very concerned about UXO. Somebody yesterday mentioned that if you don't have uh, phosphates or, or mustard gas in your waters, you're okay. I will, I will ask that person to think again. TNT is carcinogenic. It leaches carcinogen, so it leaches cancer. Okay, so we, are, we started a project by um, sampling sponges to see whether the sponges next to unexploded ordnance react differently or are impacted differently to sponges away from the unexploded ordnance. And we just got the go ahead to start uh, catching a type of fish, rockfish, that lives uh, in our, on our protected uh, wrecks because we protected them, no fishing, and then we've got to apply for a permit to fish on our own wrecks. And what we'll be looking at are especially the livers, to check for fatty liver and to check for tumors on, on, on the liver. That will inform us as to what is the uptake of the marine life of these carcinogens. Can you eat one of these fish? Because you cannot fish on our protected wrecks, but there are hundreds of wrecks 
uh, in and around Maltese territorial waters that are not protected that the fishermen, these, this, this new fashion of jigging, uh, know about and will catch fish. So we want to calculate what is the uptake. Do you, need, do you eat a fish a day? Uh, every, you know, for every day and you're safe, or do you eat one fish and, you know, you may grow a tail uh, in 48, uh, 48 hours. Um, I know I, I talk about it lightly, but uh, in order to lobby your, your, you cannot go and lobby with the Minister of the Environment or Minister of Defense without the scientific information in, uh, in hand. Um, marine plastics, that's another big word, um, and shipwrecks are yardsticks. Where does the marine plastic get stuck? On shipwrecks, because otherwise the current will slowly take them to the abyss. So why not use um, shipwrecks as yardsticks with people who study the marine environment to calculate what types of plastic move, how they move, how fast they move, how they break up, how they're impacting the sea life. This is the same plane I showed you. Uh, somehow bottles jump into the wing. I don't know how, but. Um, and then to help us, we're also developing systems with AI. This is the uh, Towerek uh, Park. It's 70,000 square meters of amphoras. I'll be damned if I'm going to count them. Uh, so far, no student has uh, volunteered to, to count them. So we're, uh, we're, we're teaching AI how to not only quantify, but also qualify um, underwater cultural heritage, basically. And then we can upscale this to map ammunition that is dumped in our waters, okay? Being a NATO base for decades, any ammunition, so a lot and a lot of TNT would be taken out to sea. And, uh, and dumped. And if it's older than 50 years, it's historic dumping in our law. That's cultural heritage as well. So, besides the 3D photogrammetry giving us a pretty picture, being able to, to overlay, being, uh, using the data in multiple forms also helps us be proactive. So now we create a 2D, 2D image of the shipwreck that we've, uh, that we've surveyed and then superimpose blueprints. So if we're approached, with the, first of all, we can study what the integrity of the metal is close to, so the red outline is where the fuel tanks are. Let me make that clear, sorry. Um, so we can, when we visit the site, or citizen science, when, when our, uh, local dive clubs visit the site, uh, we can ask them to inspect this area and we you know whether there are any new cracks that show up, etc. Or if we're approached by the British government because they have two million to throw out, to throw towards us to clear oil. From, uh, from some of the shipwrecks that we have, then we know exactly where, where to take them. Uh, and sharing is obviously important. Sharing amongst the academic community is important, but let's face it, as much as we think that our um, subject matter is exciting, and it, indeed it is, but when you publish academically, you know, if you're lucky, you get 500 reads, maybe a thousand if it's a seminal paper, and then what? So what, you know? So it's very, very important that as heritage managers, that as, as people who are involved in underwater cultural heritage, to look for and find and utilize various tools that are out there. For example, Google Arts and Culture is free. If you have a good story to tell, they will accept it and they will put it up with all their millions of users. Okay, this is a, an effort we are particularly proud of, which is the uh, virtual museum underwatermalta.org. So all the data that we gathered, you know, for 3D models, for management, for counting coral, et cetera, et cetera, also goes to share with the general public. I didn't include a slide because, because of the time constraint. Clear, we have 22 heritage sites that are open to the public via a booking system. So the dive centers need to register with Heritage Malta. Once they register, Heritage Malta gives the dive centers access to a booking system. 
once a ticket is booked, obviously divers booking, they need to sign terms and conditions, no penetration, look no touch, respect the sea life, etc., etc. Those divers accessing the sites are put on a database so we know at least legitimately who has been and who, <clears throat> who has not. And then they, uh, they access, they access the, uh, the, the site. Um, but people who dive in ratio to the world's population is tiny. People who dive beyond 60 meters is minuscule. So our job is not to take people to the site, that's taken care of, but we need to figure out how to take the site to the people. So the museum is one, one way that, uh, that we do that. Um, however, we are extremely, extremely proud of this uh, initiative called Dive into History 360. So whatever project we do, we record our project with a bespoke 360 camera. Uh, whether it's in uh, 20 meters, of, whether it's in six meters of water, our student excavation, or 130 meters of water, it is imperative. Yes, we do the sonar, we do the 3D, we do the sampling, but we also do the 360. And for free, we offer this service to all schools um, and all government agencies involved, such as active aging centers, you know, where, where, where people of retirement age go and spend the day doing, doing activities. And the idea behind this is two. We're not there to convince them all to become maritime archaeologists. I need to protect my job, of course. But we're there to do two things. We're there to make the kids fall in love with the ocean. These are marine biologists. These could be policy makers of the future. And we're also there to unlock their imagination. If you love IT, you love AI, you know, there's something you can do in, in marine sciences. If you love languages, you can write scripts for documentaries, etc. So, um, just to give you an idea, we have a very small population, but uh, just in November, which was our, our record year, we covered approximately 1,200 school children. But nobody is to be left behind. I was, I was blown away by Antonio's slide of, of, of the disabled person diving the site. Uh, this is an effort where we take underwater cultural heritage to the blind. I told you I was mad, I told you I was obsessive. And nobody gets left behind. So in this case, we created a, a set of uh, objects, including a 3D, a 3D model. Each station was manned by uh, one of our team and students, and we allowed the participants to, to explore um, the objects, uh, etc. And I must say that uh, it was a, a fantastic uh, success. The other aspect of shipwrecks is memory, and I think we, sh we, we, we give we do not give the credit that, uh, that, that memory is due. Thousands of people who are still alive today um, have some kind of connection. It was mentioned yesterday, World War II is more popular than World War I. That's because the connections are still very much, you know, grandchildren, uh, grand great nephews, etc. And these are photos of uh, the funeral of Sergeant Newman, Irvine Newman, who we recovered from a B-24 off Malta. He was uh, buried with full military honors in Arlington just a few weeks ago. So the next slide is a reflection of, uh, of my obsession. And I'm not saying that this is sort of the way forward, etc. This is the way we do it, the way we found works for us. We have our advantages because of our geography. You know, we've, we were a small country, um, <clears throat> so, so in a way it's easier, and in a way it's more difficult because more fishermen are, have more access to the shipwrecks, more looters, etc. So I'm not going to stay explaining, but believe you me, everything that I've done is, is connected, and uh, uh, thank you for your patience in, in listening to this obsessive heritage manager stroke archaeologist.
Muchísimas gracias, Timmy. Muy, muy Thank you very much, Timmy. Highly interesting, highly fascinating presentation. Well, we have only a few minutes left. Jeff would like to give the floor to Rafael Sabio, and then we will open the floor to our audience for questions. Rafael Sabio is the director of the National Museum of Underwater Archaeology, ARWA, well known by or acknowledged by the 21 Convention. He will tell us about Mazarón 2 Shipwreck, which is the major big project that we do have here in Spain. And well, he will be kicking his presentation. He promised that. Uh, Thank you very much. I would like to congratulate the organizers of this highly interesting meeting. Paloma Maria Marza. Thank you to them all. The case of Mazarón II is one of those paradigmatic cases uh, in terms of what we can do and how to show to the public how to uh, such as delicate examples, such as a Phoenician shipwreck, which is defined as one of the structures of a vessel. Well, we don't know whether it could be ascribed to the Phoenicians, but it was from the uh, 6th century before Christ. The shipwreck was uh, found in 1994 at the Isla beach on the uh, Murcia municipality. It was um, random finding, random discovery. Well, there is Mazarón 1, but this has been named Mazarón 2. It was a structure of a frame of a vessel that was quite well preserved, surprisingly, because it comes from 6th century before Christ. But before, when we were about to extract it, we were lucky enough. Well, it is like a two-sided luck. And we found a shipwreck, which was much better preserved than Mazarón 1. It was an eight-meter length vessel. So here we can see Navy techniques that are very, very interesting to get a full understanding or great understanding about that period. So in the first place, we decided to excavate the shipwreck. Well, the structure was complex, and we also decided to cover it to ensure protection. It was not easy, I mean, it was not considered a final solution, a final solution, but actually it has protected it since 1990s. So we see the next uh, period where regular inspections were carried out, also photogrammetry and drawings. So here, these are one of the photographs that were carried out in 2008 when it was open to the public in a new uh, seat of what was the previous archaeology, marine archaeology museum, and now known as Aqua. This photograph was taken by Jose Antonio. And later on in time, other uh, regular inspections were carried out. But then, we reached to 2022 after towing and throwing. We decided to organize an international meeting of experts to discuss the way to go, what to do next for the shipwreck. Well, the international meeting of experts concluded that due well, the shipwreck was found because there was a change of the dynamic of the coast uh, due to climate conditions, so therefore it was needed. It was absolutely, well, it was decided to extract it. Then we discussed the procedure to extract it, how to, whether we wanted to extract it as a whole or in different parts. Then we, it was also set up how to take it to the museum. And then 
follow-up monitoring was another issue that was discussed at the international meeting that is very, very important, follow-up and monitoring that will give us an answer as to how the treatment that the vessel has uh, received is performing. After that, a number of prior studies were conducted that were also needed for the later extraction of the vessel, of the shipwreck, that were carried out in Jan, uh, spring 2023 by a team of the University of Valencia, led by Carlos de Juan. This was a project uh, supported by the regional government, the Ministry from Culture, Aqua Museum. So that is to say, we carried out teamwork. We worked as a team. We managed to map the structure. And we have taken very important samples, as we can see on the screen. As we could see from the sampling that the shipwreck could be extracted in pieces, but not disassembling it, not after disassembling it, which is often the case then in some cases in modern times, but the shipwreck is enormously fragmented. Here we see lots of cracking on the frame, and they will be used as a guide for us to uh, split it in fragments, to divide it in fragments that will help us extract it for it later treatment at the museum. And here we see in this very last slide the facilities of a museum. We have the lab known as Arquatech. And here we are seeing the preparing, preparing the equipment for receiving the ship wreck. So the museum has bought a filtering system, filtering equipment. Well, we will be acquiring a lyophilization equipment. Well, we will carry out that lyophilization process uh, within two years. We have had technical support. We also received the necessary equipment. Uh, and we are ready. We are ready to receive Masaron to shipwreck. And then after that, we will <coughs> show it. And, we, and therefore, we, it will not be kept, but we will also share it with the public. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Rafael. Thank you very much, Rafael. As you can see, well, Timmy said that he is obsessed with the uh, UCH. We are obsessed with Mazarón 2. Mazarón 2 is everywhere. You see it there also on the front cover of the handout that we gave you. We are obsessed uh, about it. And well, now we want to open the uh, Q&A for our audience. Please go ahead with your questions or comments. Edward? Panel, thank you to all your speakers. My question relates to uh, the looting of wrecks and uh, the um, these um, gold and um, valuable pieces which are put uh, on the market. Um, the international community is uh, strengthening its mobilization for many years now to uh, reinforce the uh, provenance uh, and the diligence on the um, cultural objects which are put at auctions notably and on the market. And uh, we have noticed um, a decrease in the auctions of archaeology pieces. Uh, from the past decades in particular. And I, th I have the feeling that it is the same for uh, underwater um, objects which are coming from uh, hunting and, and lootings from wrecks. But I would like to know if in your um, um, position as policeman or um, um, uh, 
um, decision makers, uh, law enforcing authorities, you have also noticed a decrease in this kind of auctions and uh, such objects putting at, um, on sale, and even on the virtual uh, market on eBay and such uh, internet platforms. Is it really the case? Thank you. Thank you, Edward. Thank you for your question. As I said at the end of my presentation, the fact that there are more and more an increasing number of platforms, well, online platforms are a challenge for us. Uh, so, for instance, see Katawiki. Katawiki has its uh, registered domicile at the Netherlands. Well, if we want to question them, we have to go through Siena Channel, through Europol, and uh, most likely the police forces of the Netherlands would ask Katawiki. And that makes it complicated things. To give you an absurd example, if Picasso were to be stolen today and were found on Katawiki, Perhaps we, as police forces, cannot really find out who put it on sale, who is behind all that. That's ridiculous, isn't it? So I think there are some European directives aimed at that, that is to say, at requesting those online platforms, those marketplaces, to comply with uh, stricter requirements. Well, we can ask for the uh, stop of auctions, but through a European order of research. Or, uh, what are we seeing as police uh, forces or bodies? We are seeing more pieces in the market, but in case of UCH, it should be easier for us to track that. When we are talking about a piece that comes from the seabed, the actual context is already telling you that someone has taken it out. Well, when we are talking about land archaeology, well, who knows, perhaps the provenance may come from, well, you know, okay, the uh, past EU, e European collection or a British gentleman, this kind of absurd provenances. Well, for instance, the actual convention that actually regulates illicit trafficking was aimed at preventing the trafficking among countries. So therefore, the ministries have to increase the level of uh, requirements when it comes to issuing authorizations and permissions and they need to be um, stricter uh, for marketplaces. And then, so if the piece comes from underwater, please tell me how you took it out. Well, we don't even keep the invoice of a phone that we bought a month ago. And what about an amphora that was owned by a British gentleman? Of course, there would not be there would be no invoice, but let us be stricter. Okay, let us not allow that type of trading, that type of buying and selling, okay, if we don't know the provenance of it. Well, all in all, yes, we are seeing uh, increasing uh, one number of pieces, but it also helps us recover more. There are more, we recover more. Perspective and from our task force perspective, we haven't seen the numbers drop. We've just seen the numbers shift or the places shift. So where places like uh, you know Christie's or, or Sotheby's might not be doing it as often, although they still do, we're seeing a lot of the pieces move to secondary auction houses or tertiary auction houses, sort of those second and third tiers. They've gone off Broadway, so to speak. Or you know, we see them being moved on social media platforms, or we see them moved in uh, you know, private groups in Facebook, in Instagram, and elsewhere. And you know, that's part of where our training comes in. We, we try and get everyone to build those intelligence networks between law enforcement, between museums, between 
uh, cyber investigators and then also train those people to understand how they can do social media scraping, how they can look for the, the, the bits and pieces that will lead to a, a broader network that's actually operating and moving these pieces. Um, and that, that's kind of sort of what we've seen. And we've seen the pieces go to galleries, honestly. Uh, the, the largest target point and the best way to disrupt any of these networks is to go where the money is and the money's in the galleries. It's not necessarily at the auction houses because the auction houses are far too public. If something goes up in Sotheby's catalog, everyone in the world can find it and pinpoint it. But if you're selling from a small gallery in Vienna or here in Madrid, it's, I mean, there's going to be people watching you, but it's not as obvious. So. Sí, adelante. Until today, I was convinced that, that uh, treasure hunter corporations were based in the United States. And I'm very grateful to Mr. Monteiro uh, to uh, show me that uh, also other treasure hunter corporations are based in European states. But I am concerned about uh, one of his remarks. Uh, he said that treasure hunter corporations are now adapting themselves to the UNESCO Convention. In my view, it is impossible to adapt themselves because of Article 4 of the Convention, which prohibits any kind of treasure hunter activity. Am I wrong? Is there any possibility to adapt themselves. It seems to me an unsurmountable obstacle to any kind of adaptation. And my, my second question is uh, for Mr. Gambin about pollution by plastic. Uh, we, we know that it is very harmful for the natural environment. I, is it also harmful for the protection of the cultural heritage? Uh, Mr. Montero first. Can I? Uh, yes. <clears throat> there are three kinds of looting in marine environment. The first one is by petty divers. These sites that are easily reachable, they are not there anymore. They have been already looted. The other one is by companies like Archonautas. They make money not basically by doing treasure hunting and selling the artifacts. They do it by going into um, fi having financial shares sold. So they need to be public. And they will say, we have this very good business model where you will invest $100,000 and we will find this huge San Jose wreck in Colombia and your revenue is going to be $1 billion. So they need to be public, and that's why we know a lot of what they are doing. They are also trying to hire archaeologists or pretense archaeologists and have legal bindings with these failed states or vulnerable states, like Brazil, Indonesia, uh, Mozambique, Cape Verde. The other one that is really, really dangerous is all of these people that have these huge seagoing survey vessels that work in offshore mining or in oil platforms, people from Scotland, people from the United Kingdom. These are the people that have archivists like Nigel Pickford, and they will go like for the city of Cairo. They will pinpoint this wreck in 1,000 meters deep, 2,000 meters deep, and they will go there, destroy the wreck, take the gold inside from a World War I or World War II shipwreck, and be gone with it, and nobody will know it. So this is what is happening. But to respond directly to your question, David Mearns, which is a guy that is called the shipwreck hunter, uh, he was uh, involved with blue water recoveries in Oman in 1998. He owns blue water. Yeah, he owns blue water, yeah. He was working on the Barry Clifford. It was uh, an American ship sunk in World War II, and he was recovering uh, a lot of silver coins from that wreck to an Omani investor. 
He got tipped that in some islands of Oman there was the remains of two Portuguese shipwrecks. Before the convention, he offered those Portuguese shipwrecks for Robert Marine Fraser as a treasure venting stuff so people could invest and then get the artifacts and sell them. Then, as the convention took foot, he discovered that better than doing this, he would go to the Sultan of Oman and make a deal. And what he did was a travesty of science. I know what I'm saying. He paid a lot of experts from ceramics and shipwrecks and metal detection and whatever, and he hammered the data that it had to tell the right story. So he went to the shipwreck site with the agreement of the Omani um, government. He had open access publications published in Aizna, although we raised several ethical questions, but money that kept flowing into that operation told the story that they have now found the shipwreck of Vasco da Gama. And when you look at it into your scientist at, it's a complete circus. But it has been in National Geographic, it has appeared in documentaries, it has found its way into scientific papers, scientific journals, it has never been critiqued. And they made money out of the shipwreck. So that's what I'm saying. These bogus players that are not real scientists he was a guy that is not a marine archaeologist and is the leading author of this open access uh, publication in Aizna. It's hijacking. It's hijacking, yes. It's, 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 it's riding this horse of very good media that shipwrecks have with the public and transvestiting it from a treasure hunting venture into a science uh, thing. They are not making money by selling the artifacts, but they are making money from other sources. Right. I'll try and remember my answer. So, one, plastics harm the experience. So, if you're opening sites to divers, just like yesterday's visit to the museum, it would not have been nice if the museum had garbage, you know, all around. So it does harm the experience. Two, plastic harms the sea life, the marine life, which we now know protects the metal, etc. But three, mo most uh, or just as importantly, what Arturo said, shipwreck as a means of further research. So in the future, if somebody is designing a microbe or a Pac-Man robot to eat microplastics, for example, how are you going to design it? Based on what? Based on what knowledge? How much microplastic is in the abyss? You know, m many of us have studied very deep shipwrecks with plastic in. So, by using shipwrecks as a yardstick, so to quantify uh, come up with models, okay, so this is how much plastic is trapped off the shipwreck of Malta, then with modeling you can say, therefore, over the past 40 years in this tract, there may be 10 times as much plastic in the abyss, which will help people designing solutions for microplastics. So, in those three points, I think, you know, plastics and shipwrecks do have a, uh, a story to, to, to tell. Bueno, sintiéndolo mucho lo tenemos que dejar aquí. Unfortunately, we, time is over. Oh, right. We close our round table, highly interesting round table. Thank you very much for all our speakers. I would have spent a whole day just having a conversation with you. And well, now it's time for a family picture, group photograph. We will have the photograph taken here before coffee break. Thank you, everyone.